Executive of the Chamber and welcome to this SICC ESSEC Leadership Series event, a fireside chat with that well-known innovation evangelist Neil Cross with the intriguing title, The Future Isn't Digital. What's up this afternoon will be um, a chat between Neil and Professor Jan Ondrus, the Associate Dean of Faculty at ESSEC Asia Pacific. There will be time for your Q&A, so at any time during um, the, the chat, feel free to type in your questions in the Q&A um, function, which you'll find in the, the uh, Zoom toolbar, usually at the bottom of your screen. Our title sponsor today is Chamber Member ESSEC a well-known and respected international business school with French roots. Established in 1907 in France, today ESSEC has campuses in France, Morocco, and here in Singapore. The Financial Times has recently ranked it in the top 10 of business schools in Europe. I want to thank ESSEC for sponsoring our leadership series events in 2020. The school's Bachelor of Business Administration and the Master's programs all exist to prepare leaders of integrity for their future responsibilities. And this is where there is a nice fit uh, between what the school is doing and the Chamber's focus on continually stressing uh, the importance of leadership and its responsibilities to build not just better companies, but better society. That's why we have this series of events. So with no further ado, I'm going to hand you over to Jan and Neil. I'll be back um, at the end of the webinar just to make some very brief closing remarks. Thank you very much. Jan, Neil, it's all yours. Webinar, very brief closing remarks. Thank you very much, Jan, Neil, it's all yours. Okay. Thank you very much, Victor, for the kind introduction. Uh, so my name is Jan Ambus. I'm uh, currently, as Victor was saying, the Associate Dean of Faculty at DESEC Business School uh, based in Singapore, and uh, also an Associate Professor of uh, Information Systems. So I've been a professor at DESEC for about 40, uh, 13 years now, uh, doing research and teaching on different topics related to digital transformation, digital disruption, uh, and more generally, I would say, uh, business model innovation in the digital age. Uh, so I'm currently teaching in the Global MBA, uh, Executive MBA, and some other uh, executive programs that we have at ESSEC. And all the topics are related to digital. Uh, so there's a growing demand from professionals in general to be trained in this topic. And so um, among the different digital topics occupying my research time over the years. Uh, one topic has been always quite central in uh, what I was doing is uh, to look at mobile payments. So payment with uh, mobile phones. So I started about 20 years ago when uh, the first mobile payment was conducted in Sweden when someone used a cell phone to buy a Coca-Cola drink out of a vending machine with an SMS. And so I started the investigation uh, mainly in the US first and then Switzerland where I started my PhD. And uh, over the years, I conducted research on this topic around the globe, most, mostly focusing on Asia. Um, so Korea and, and, and Japan were quite advanced at that time. And so I observed a number of hypes when new products and technology were launched um, and the following failures that happen right after launches usually. And so often the reasons of this failure is that the market was not ready or the technology was not ready. And worse, sometimes uh, there wouldn't be any business case at all. Uh, and so. Uh, more, uh, more recently, I've been involved on multiple research projects here in Singapore. Um, one uh, specific project is with the uh, MAS, the Monetary Authority of Singapore, and uh, Enterprise Singapore, and also People's Association. And it's to look at how to move to a cashless society. And so interestingly, the, the question of the digital divide came up quite quickly. So we move sometimes very fast on the technology side, but we forget to embark users sometimes uh, during this kind of uh, initiatives. And so the human factor um, it shouldn't be neglected. And I think that's gonna occupy quite a bit of our conversation with Neil today. Um, uh, today we observe also that many companies are jumping on the bandwagon of digital without really knowing why and how to do so. And the pace is accelerating. So we see more and more companies jumping and, and, and trying to, to embrace digital. Uh, in, a, in, in some way it could be good, 
uh, in other ways it can also lead to mistakes and so in order um, to to understand uh, the, why people do these things they need to first understand what is their purpose or what kind of problems do they try to solve and and i guess it's something that uh, neil will, will will talk about today the the fact that uh, digital for the sake of digital doesn't make much sense um and, and just for the background of the discussion um we have this uh, today with neil um about a year ago uh, i had the pleasure to stay in, in his hotel in uh, indonesia with uh, our global mba students so we have been doing that for the last three years now and uh, on one evening um, neil was talking to the students and he briefly mentioned that he started to talk about the future isn't digital which is the title of today's conversation and considering how much people at the time already was were pushing quite an opposite kind of vision um, i was really intrigued about what he meant by this and i was uh, patiently, I would say, or impatiently waiting for our students to ask questions about this topic. And the conversation went on and on and on, tackling many different topics, and it didn't come. And so at the end of the Q&A session, uh, I couldn't resist to ask him, what about this topic? Can, can you tell us more about this? And so the food was ready, the time was short, it was already late at night, so we could just start the conversation then. And so now after a, a year of waiting, to continue the discussion. I'm really excited today to deepen this conversation today with Neil, um, especially during this COVID-19 situation, uh, which revealed new opportunities, new threats for organizations to when it comes to digital transformation. So, so just to jumpstart the conversation, uh, Neil, um, so you, you made this statement, the future isn't digital. And some could say it's quite a provocative statement. So could you please explain to us what you mean by this and who are you trying to impact with this statement? Okay, so the background on that really is I was running out of provocative things to say. And so I thought, okay, you know, I'm known as Mr. Provocative. Uh, so uh, let me look around. And something that was really annoying me was I was getting a lot of, I mean, I've been in technology a, a you know, a very long time and, you know, as I, as we were discussing out in the hotel orangutan um and and so i started to see a wave of people having very like um technology focused and um almost kind of um very almost come to jesus kind of thing about technology again which was weird i've been in technology since you know i started, started writing code at 11. and i thought this is a bit odd and I got people coming to me and trying to educate me on AI and, you know, other wonderful stuff that, um, <laughs> you know, I've kind of done a little bit before. And, and, you know, I chat to them and it started to really, especially around, um, I suppose, it triggered it kind of blockchain AI, and especially blockchain people come to me and, you know, say to them, hey, um, what, um, what, what do you do? So I chat to a lot of startups, you know, what do you do? What, what are you into? Uh, oh, yeah, we're a blockchain startup. I go, yeah, yeah, okay. Um, what do you do? What do you do as a startup? What's your thing, your business model? Or a blockchain startup? And I'm like, uh, okay, uh, it's a blockchain, yeah. Uh, what, what do you do? And I go, oh, oh you know, I, I must be a PowerPoint startup. Uh, well, what do you mean? You design a new version of PowerPoint? Oh, no, I, I use PowerPoint so I can describe my company as a PowerPoint startup. I use a chair. I'm a chair startup. I, you know, I go on the internet, so I'm an HTML startup. Uh, and my point was, why we? How did we suddenly start to describe ourselves based on our construction materials, our tools, mm -hmm. to create something? You know, and obviously chatting to this startup, I'd be patient with them, and you know they're doing, um, you know, FX over blockchain, um, and and so you know they're an FX, they're they're an FX, you know, startup. They're not a blockchain startup, and, and so that sort of, that kind of set off a flag, and I started looking at it and go, okay, what's going on then? Um, someone who who has been in, in tech a long time and started looking around and 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 seeing that there was this big draw towards you know technology can solve anything um, uh, kind of mega trend and a lot of misunderstanding around what these technologies actually can and can't do and blah 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 and and the assumption that technology could fix everything uh, which, uh, you know I kind of found that quite amusing. Uh, I still, in my, you know, and, and I'm not that old, but, you know, almost 50, started in tech when I was 11. Um, I still haven't seen one technology project that's been on time, on specification, and on budget. 
and I, I've, I've, I've never even heard of one and I've never seen one. Um, and so I always kind of smile when, when you know, I, I hear that technology is going to solve everything. And, and, you know, I start to look at, well, wait a minute, what are they saying? So you start to deconstruct it. And really what they, you know, the thing was the big kind of, you know, mega trend around digitization. So digitization is, you know, going to, um, you know, fundamentally change all these businesses, digital disruption, the fear factor of these disruptors coming and using technology to upend the incumbents and, you know, drive a lot of cost out and get to huge scale using digital. Um, and so that that started me on the thinking train then, okay, so that, yeah, but that's not how the world's change really. And um, and I thought, so the technology for me is very simple. It gets easier every year. You just plug bits together and those bits years ago when I was writing assembler were very tiny bits. And then over time, the bits get bigger. It gets actually technology gets simpler and simpler and simpler. We think it gets more complex, but in fairness, it gets simpler. And so, what's the hard bit? What's the bit where people aren't focusing? And, you know, I have this view that any system, when you, when you do a digital transformation, I see so many go wrong, is because they're not thinking about where the humans go and where the robots go. And so the robots interchange with the word data or technology or software or AI, if you must, you know, robots, and then you've got human assets. And then if you're restructuring the architecture of your organization, you've got to kind of work out where those goes. But no one was talking about the humans. And so that was probably the quite the longest answer I've ever done uh, <laughs> to a question. But that that really is why, uh, you know, why it made me start thinking about, but what about the humans? Yeah, in this thing, because we're not going to live as people wearing VR glasses with, you know, drips in us, feeding food, you know, consuming you know online content 24 hours a day that's that you know that that's not going to be the reality there's a place for humans there's a place for robots and but we're kind of missing that in digital transformation yeah thanks for this first answer but i i just wonder when you when you explain that to people uh when you share these these views your views how do they react do they understand what you mean are they Kind of resistant, blinded by digital buzzwords, and they don't understand really. They cannot see beyond what you're explaining, because it, it, for many, uh, technology for the sake of technology is 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 great. It's uh, as you mentioned the example with the blockchain. How do they react when you explain that? Do they understand? Do they uh, agree or they reject? Um, um, so it depends how much they've got vested in it. And so if they're going around and calling themselves a blockchain guru, obviously self-appointed. Um, they're going to react badly, yeah, it's, and they'll probably say I'm rude or this or that, and just, you know, the reality of the thing, they've overinvested in something and, you know, it colours their view. Um, it really, you know, there's ways to kind of position and cut through. And when I say to people, you know, you, you know me, I'm quite, I like to be quite, I, I like to go back to first principles. So what problem are we solving? That's always what I go back to, you know, the one of the first questions I ask, I go, yeah, I find that we run off and we go into problem solving mode and mode and we try and plug in those technology and then I get called in and say, Hey Neil, this thing isn't working with this and blah blah blah. Do a lot of work with conglomerates at the moment and how they interface and doing conglomerate innovation, which is a you know, completely different field. But it, it's very interesting um looking at how they're kind of, you know, struggling to work together and and um and be effective. And it's uh it's very tough to to you know i have to ask them because there's so much noise as you said you've got the product providers creating noise you've got the thought leaders um all the different variations you know everyone with a twitter account um you've got regulators and governments trying to put their view in you've got large corporates tech companies blah 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 but go back to first principles and so why are you doing a data project so i get called in i say you're doing a big data project i'll chat to a ceo or um, chief data officer yeah of course we do data lakes and you know stream insight data and you know self-serve you know analytics and obviously ai machine learning and um, um and other stuff and um you know do you think it's a good strategy and i'm like well you know how much are you spending if they are whatever 10 or 50 or 200 million or sometimes more <laughs> well, i don't know i go it but for me can it answer one question 
uh, if your strategy can, if the whole output of your strategy can answer this one question, then I think it's worthwhile. And um, I say, okay, what's the question? And I'm like, well, what's your most valuable piece of data, the single piece of data, and how much is it worth? Because unless you answer that, why are you doing a data transformation? <laughs> Sorry. Mm. Uh, you know, if, if your transformation isn't getting you these really impactful and really, really important answers, you know, that's just base level stuff. Me, that's entry level. The next right. question then defines your partnership and ecosystem strategy, which is how can I add that to external data and what's the multiplier? So if this bit of data is worth 10 bucks, you know, and I see something else out there that I can get for five bucks, but if I mix it with this one and then suddenly it's worth 20 bucks, then I've kind of made some return on that. And, and thinking really deeply about why you're doing something, because essentially data really is all business the the really when you think about the operational um purpose and outcome of a company is to move data around and so you see the moving, moving data from your customer's head through an app you know into you into your processes into something bring it out and boom boom, boom and off to partners and that you could kind of liken the fact that you know that's all really that, that the companies are doing is moving data around. And if, you, if you're just following a buzzword and just kind of cleaning house on information, it's wasted money unless you're answering something. So, anyway, so I work with a company and they do, they um, sell cars, yeah? Big, massive, one of the uh, very significant names, I won't tell you who they are. Anyway, so first CEO actually worked said to me, he said, Neil, I think we can work this out. And so what we did, we worked out the, said the most, he said the most important piece of information he knew was registration number. He was bang. The first CEO said straight back to me, registration number, but I don't know how much it's worth. I said, all right, so let's work it out. So if you got given a million registration numbers, email and phone number, uh, how, how much of the, that business could you bring up and close? So how, how if you rang up a million, or say a thousand, uh, try to keep massive, or say a thousand reg numbers, car registration numbers, and he said, oh, maybe we'll sell 1%. Okay, so you ring up a thousand, you sell 10 cars. Yeah, okay, all right. And, um, and so uh, how much profit do you make per car? Well, I'll say, you know, let's keep it simple, a thousand dollars. Okay, so you make a thousand dollars per car, you sell 10 cars per thousand leads, and so, you know, suddenly you've got a uh, thousand by ten. So you've got ten thousand dollars off a thousand records, and so cost per record is ten dollars. Yeah. So if you the profit per record, say per data item of reg number plus the contact is, uh, you know, um, ten dollars, then all you've got to work out is a way to extract uh, more registration numbers and contact details that's less than ten dollars. And so that's, that's for me is really always ask why, what problem are you solving and have, and have some guidance around an understanding of really what businesses have construct, what are their construction materials today and, and always watch where the money flows is, is a tip I've learned. A lot of business say, yeah, we're this shape, this color, actually no, there's they're something over here, completely vastly different. Um, yeah, thanks for sharing this uh, this uh, this example. So, so it seems that many do not really understand the concept of digital transformation or digital disruption. And and from what you say, uh, a lot of companies may have big projects, very costly projects that um, they don't really understand well. Especially the, the, the let's say the top management, they've been advised to to do something, but as you mentioned, they might not know what is the the value of it. So, so from your perspective, can you share your understanding of um, what really digital transformation or digital disruption means? So in your different roles, you, you must have been involved in discussions with people who heard the terms but, or the concepts, but they don't really understand. And, and so if you had to explain to them in a 
very simple way with maybe some examples based on your experiences. Uh, what does it mean to transform um, digitally and, and, and maybe what does it mean to disrupt uh, using digital, also digital disruption? Okay, uh, so yeah, let's go back to first principles. So what caused digital disruption? Um, a lot of, and this is the core of the issue, uh, uh, we all just kind of think it's about technology here. And, uh, and so the, the kind of key players we hold up in this space, the Amazons of the world, the Ubers, um, the Airbnbs, we see them as utilizing technology to um, disrupt a, an incumbent business. Yeah, and very you know, amazing um, work they've done in that space. But in my mind, they never had, they don't have, have any secret technology. Most of the things we think about technology today, we use the word technology, actually we just mean lines of C or Java code. <laughs> Pretty much it. Um, and so it's just basically software and different lines of code reorganized. That's blockchain, reorganize the code again, that's AI, reorganize the code again. And that, you know, that's mobile payments, reorganize the code again, and that's augmented reality. You know, we we'll call that technology. Anyway, that's another subject. But the, um, uh, the point is that the digital disruption, even though it's enabled by technology and people using technology quicker and smarter, commodity technology quicker and smarter than everyone else, uh, meant they had more agility. Uh, but it wasn't technology which disrupted these industries. It was, and these companies, it was, in my mind, it was they solved your customer's job you know the job to be done um, better than you and and that's the important thing and so if you look at all through history there's been companies who tend to fail really emit, there's a disconnect and we see this a lot in finance disconnect between what the company thinks they do and what the customers think they do yeah and so if you think about a bank a bank says you know well, i you know i give car loads but actually what a customer thinks customer thinks well um, you've solved my transport problem yeah. And then a bank says, I give insurance. And the customer says, well, you protect the people I love. And the bank says, I give you investments. And a customer says, well, you've given me my child's education. And so when the disparity between what when industry or company thinks they do and what the customer base does, there's, there's you know, um, opportunists have inserted themselves in there using technology and solve the problem better. Netflix over blockbusters, you know. What problem were blockbusters solving? Not video rental. You know, it was quite obvious. Yeah, it's entertainment, boredom. <laughs> you know, Netflix solved it, solved it better. Um, what problem? I love the Kodak. Everyone uses Kodak, uh, but I think in, in, in maybe in the wrong way. You know, what business was Kodak in? It wasn't film processing. It was helping people store memories. You know, and so if you forget and you get so far to the from your client base, then then people using smart technology, more agile, lower cost base, VC funding, you know, they can kind of spread around by unrealistic, using, utilizing unrealistic, maybe even unmonetizable ever business models. Um, we've seen a few of those. And, and so they insert themselves. So then that's digital disruption, essentially what I, th I look around and I, I see happening. Um, and, and so you've got to, I mean, my thing is you've got to compete, but you don't have to emulate everything. And if you look at the, uh, you know, I did this talk a, a, quite a while ago at the um, G20 in 2016, uh, when I did the, like the, the heads of the central banks, we had all the regulators and central banks globally there um, up in China. And, you know, I said, look, the bus is coming from the other way. So it's great you're looking at FinTech, it's great you're getting excited about innovation, you know, it's great, you, you know, your regulators are wearing T-shirts, and that's fantastic. I said, it's, a, you know, a little uncomfortable because it's like watching your grandparents learn to skateboard. Uh, but uh, apart from that, doing a great job. But the bus is coming the other way. And so the bus is coming from the world of tech here. Yeah? It's the tech uh, companies have unfair advantage um, in many different ways, but, you know, tend to be, even though, uh, they tend to be monolithic uh, data monetizers. You know, I'm thinking the Facebook, the Google, the Snapchat, you know, you know, monolithic as in nearly all their 
revenue and profit comes from advertising yet yeah, and selling data. Um, they they have an unfair advantage in in my mind, and they do need to uh, be um, contained. Korea is a great example. So South Korea, they have specific regulation for Samsung and financial services. Sam, uh, uh, this I think it's still true today. They don't let Samsung have a bank, like a, I mean, like a proper bank. Yeah, they can do various partnerships, do payments, fintech cards, other stuff, because you know everyone in Korea has forty-eight thousand Samsung products, and you know it's like you know you know which way that's going to go. <laughs> Samsung bank, Samsung biggest bank um, in the domestic market, and, and so I think the the. Um, what I said is actually they're the ones that we need to watch and really um, think about um, how they could um, enter a market and have an unfair advantage, but actually what they what, uh, cause a very one-sided and um, disruptive, but not in a good way model. So let's talk about, say, Google, yeah? So we know Google, how Google works, nearly all the revenue it was dropped now there it's about 82 percent i think comes from advertising it used to be like 99.9 like facebook is but it's, it's about 80 something now maybe 80, 80 to 85 um percent the revenue comes from advertising so if google understands about neil cross um you know they say right neil cross i know you're in perth um i know you got this job title i know you rage yeah um so they could sell an advert to neil um for say 10 cents maybe it's an advert for boat key i'm middle-aged you know lived in singapore many years probably a good fit there so they'll sell an advert to me for 10 cents to advertisers if google know my search history they'll sell an advert for a dollar yeah if google knows my what i've bought my payment history then they'll sell an advert to neil for say 50 dollars and if they know my medical records they'll sell an advert to neil for maybe 200 dollars uh, and so they, that's their model. That's if, if that did not work one day, then there'd be a big hole where Google used to be because that's nearly all their revenue and, um, and certainly all their profit. Uh, and, but think about it. So if they enter finance, they can enter it. And can, a lot of the disruptors like these fintech banks and fintechs and a lot of the startup disruptors are very much driven by their model is very simple. I call it musical chairs. So you get loads of money from a VC and then you just blow it acquiring unprofitable clients, yeah? You just, you know, that's what you do, whether that's Facebook and Google ads, whether that's ridiculously low pricing, whether that's you know, ridiculously flexible insurance, whether you're paying more on claims than you, you get. Was it Lemonade was doing so 160% payout um, claims versus premium? So every customer was claiming 168 percent of their money back. <laughs> now I don't know. I wouldn't have thought that would be a particularly great insurance company. Now before IPO, they did move those numbers up to about 85 or something. But each customer, basically, on average, um, was claiming more than their pen premium. Anyway, so these this kind of grow out of nothing take the vc capital either outpriced incumbent cheap taxis you know free global payments free fx free bank whatever you want to do with that and then just grow the valuation and keep going um they as fintechs i think you know they 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 hit a point where they run out of money yeah and so they can't continually imagine they did free fx payments forever at some point the vc is going to go where's the money unless they've you know diversified into other product more profitable product streams and uh, but if they don't then it's broken but a tech company like the google model they can run a continual loss making data harvester example in finance not just google it's not bigger than facebook um you know tencent alibaba all of them yeah um uh, and and so they can continually run a discounted finance model because they're not taking VC money and, and you know, grow at all costs. They're actually taking the data, putting it over here, and then 10xing or 5xing or 2xing, you know, whatever it is, the price of an advert for that person. And so that's the, that's the really kind of big 
games that are at play that I see across many industries is the kind of circling of these leathersome, you know, tech companies positioning. Um, yeah, so, so I'm going to shift a little bit. Thanks uh, for sharing on, on this topic. So I, I wanted to, to, to explore um, something that we discussed a little bit before, which is about that the future is hybrid in the sense that, as you mentioned, uh, uh, humans and, and tech should work together to solve problems. And so uh, while, doing, while trying to do that, there's this kind of a trap with the current hypes uh, of, let's say, everything digital. Right? Everything has to be digital. I used to do uh, physical work, but now I want to go online. Uh, so, so which industries for you um, are first, what, what kind of traps do you see in that? And also maybe what kind of industries are more prone to this kind of traps? Uh, and eventually how could they avoid it? Is it a mindset that they need to shift? Is it that they need to be uh, cautious with who they talk? Is it, um, when I say that is, do they need to avoid consultants who tend to push their technologies? What, what do you think from, um, from that? So in a sense that companies need to um, somehow maybe, yeah, avoid the traps of uh, investing. As you mentioned before, I, I heard so many times uh, participants in our courses or um, even uh, people working in different companies saying, hey, you know what? Uh, I heard about blockchain. I think we need a blockchain. I'm not so sure what it is for, but everyone is saying it's great. Um, it, it's, it kind of resonates to what you were saying before. But um, what, what do you think the traps are at the moment uh, when it comes to, to this kind of uh, hype? Uh, oh. Yeah, can you? Oh, there we go. Sorry, my laptop doing something. Uh, there. Yeah. So, um, right, this is a very simple method to. Oh. Hello, can you hear me? We can hear you. Ah, good. Yeah, sorry. So, uh, you know, always, like I alluded to earlier, is what problem are you solving? And that's really the outcome you want. You actually want the simplest, I mean, some of the most powerful ways to solve problems actually are not tech at all. Yeah. Um, I've had this conversation before, we, you know, went through, and one they said, you know, this company I was working with said we want the staff to collaborate a bit more together and so we're going to create an app because uh, of course everyone wants to create an app and uh, and uh, so um, I said okay so you're going to create an app yeah and uh, how many um, and you want this so people collaborate nicer together the more lines yeah all right and uh, how many how many staff do you have you know whatever a thousand all right and how many do you think will download the app oh we reckon we can get like 30, 40 percent. Oh, okay, yeah. And then how many are going to use it kind of daily, or maybe 10 percent of that? Oh, okay, yeah. So, you know, whatever the number was, we ended up agreeing that maybe say 20 percent of the staff base optimistically uh, would, uh, you know, would use this app. So they're going through, they want me to help them with their, you know, set up their customer, you know, um, a customer journey team, design team, blah, blah, blah. And I said, what do you recommend? I said, oh, I said, I've got a brilliant, brilliant solution for you. What's that? I said, why don't you just change their KPIs? So, um, you know, why don't you think about how you create KPIs that are not only top down, the I mean, simplest KPIs are top down, yeah. Um, next level is you do bottoms up. So you do the top down first, then bottoms up, try and get them to meet in the middle. Uh, but the smart people, um, this very much, when I, my time at Microsoft, do KPIs that drive across. So how can you create um, alignment across KPIs that go across your business? And so people, uh, the idea of KPIs is not to hit a number, yeah, or they did a good job, you know, gold star, give them some money. It's actually that you want um, KPIs to drive a certain behavior. And, and so if you're smart and set a different KPI alignment across the entire group, you could hit 100% of people would be incentivized to work together rather than going down a technology route and um, building this app and rolling it out and getting maybe 10 to 20% incentivized. And, and so just always go back to first principles, you know, 
is well, are we solving the right problem? It actually, a lot of time, people think they're solving a problem, they're solving the wrong problem, and it's because I call it, you know, it's like um, it's like you see the symptom. So they see, you know, there's some noise that something needs fixing, you know, somewhere inside their organization, the industry, wherever, um, you know, on customer base. And they go off to that and think, right, I'm going to solve for that and invent something for that, not realizing actually that is caused by something deeper down here. Um, there's some kind of model at play which is, which is causing this. And, and, and so then actually ask it, actually don't solve this, just look at the core thing and, and, and see if we can solve that. And that's when you start to see really, you know, powerful cultural transformations and, and market transformations and client transformations is where you can go and address the, the big important thing, the core of the issue where everyone else has kind of missed it a bit and they've gone after um, some of the symptoms. So I see in the, in the, in the Q&A, uh, there's one question which is slightly related to what we just discussed is, is about SMEs, right? Because often we, we, we believe that digital transformation uh, or disruption can be uh, affecting or implemented in some way by large companies, while SMEs have a hard time keeping up with the changes. And so the question is about, do you have any advice how SMEs could uh, navigate all these tech providers. So beyond the hype, it's also about the, the, the yeah. kind of companies uh, roaming around SMEs and trying to sell their services. Yeah, yeah, and, and you know, there's certainly some, there's a lot of, um, you know, there's a lot of stuff to avoid around at that level. Um, I think if I'm, if I'm you know, I, in fairness, you know, my, I'm an SME, yeah, I've got, um, I, I, you know, I got, uh, my social enterprises in Indonesia, the Hotel Orangutan and Pull Away Paradise. Um, what do I use for a tech provider? I just go with the big guys, yeah? I use the Dropbox, we use Booking.com for bookings, um, everything on the cloud. And so you've got to really think as an SME um, to, you have actual advantage, you have advantage and disadvantage, it, most things in life, yeah, you, you have that. And so an SME has the ability to make decisions very quickly. Um, cultural transformation in SMEs like that, yeah, you can go and like chat to every single staff member in a week, <laughs> you know, as the, as the boss. And, and so the smaller you are, the easier it is to do a cultural pivot, um, to do a, a you know, business model pivot, any, anything that's actually could be quite dramatic. An SME is much easier, much quicker to, to do that. Um, on the downside, unless the founders and um, if the founders are in and or you're lucky and you've got good friends, it's very hard to get good talent in an SME, uh, purely because, you know, the money thing, unless you're, um, you know, a, a position, you've managed to brand yourself as a startup and then, you know, you can do options and stuff on your business. Um, uh, and so that's the downside. You don't have a, a lot of budget, um, but there's so much providers out there of just stuff. You've just got to, you know, you've just got to work out what you do. What is your business? What problem are you solving? And just plug stuff together to solve that problem. And a small business can do that very, very effectively. A large company is much, much harder. Yet. You need the big R systems and this and that. And, and so my, I suppose the summary of all of that is don't listen to the people that come talking. Just look at what the big guys are offering. Go the Amazon, the Microsoft, the um, you know uh, uh, Amazon. Uh, sorry, Microsoft, Google um, for you know collaboration, productivity, this kind of stuff. Look at the big providers for whatever tool you're doing. The cloud, you know, mass scale thing. That's your that's your best option. And your IP and your um, value is really in you understanding your business and your market and there's so much great tooling out there to that you you know you can't custom build something just for your business I mean that's you, you don't have that sort of money but you can still operate like one of the bigger guys uh, but you've got to kind of just focus on the stuff get the commodity stuff yeah keep the cost low have it commodity 
and you know as you grow then you can afford more of the um, customization on your tech stack yeah thank you for that i think it's it's a really good advice because i think a lot of uh, smes tend to be poached by other startups as smes uh, trying to sell their own thing and when that company goes bust uh, the sme is in trouble nobody can pick up uh, pick up what they they bought and and if they would have gone with the standards of the market it would have been much easier for them to to uh, to actually uh, last uh, with the time uh, i mean the as you mentioned for example for estec which is somehow an sme we decided to to to, to use for example for our uh, email uh, google right? because before we used to to operate our own servers uh, in house we we might have used also the service of uh, smaller companies also to do that but we realized that at some point by outsourcing to the bigger companies having a standard of the market it makes things much easier and so far um, Nobody has complained about uh, problems accessing emails or having issues with emails, which used to be the case all the time before. So yeah. that, that's a really good advice that you give in terms of. Yeah, uh, I mean, the maturity of the big guys is, you know, is good. You know, a one size all, you know, one size fits all. I mean, they've got multiple sizes for the thing. Um, uh, it's, it's commodity. And there's lots of interesting startups like Zoom, yeah, we're all using Zoom now. Um, it's commodity stuff, yeah. Right. It's just make the most. Don't feel like you have to build all this custom stuff, I suppose is my point. Don't get pressured into, talked into transformation. Just go back to first principles. What problems does my business solve? And what commodity technology can I find which enables me to solve that? That would that'd basically be my entire tech strategy as an right. SME at the moment. Um, I saw a question from Victor here. Yeah, so, so there's a number of questions that are quite interesting, but I have follow-up questions also. Okay. So maybe I, I, I'll moderate the questions. And, and so maybe we can go okay. to, the, to the, I think it's kind of related in some way. We were talking about SMEs versus big companies. Now, uh, I, I mentioned the problem of digital divide. And, and so we can see here that uh, there's a question about how do you try or, and convince all the employees to take the digital route? And, and for someone who is uh, 76 year old, do they need to, uh, to use younger employees to, to work out the, uh, the answers and so on and, and, and drive the change or you can still use older employees to do so? From your experience, how did it work maybe at DBS or other companies where you have uh, maybe diff different generations of people working together and, and when you go the digital route, uh, who should be leading the young ones, the old ones together? What's what's your experience with that? Okay, um, certainly who should be leading? I don't care, young, old, black, white, male, female, just the best, yeah. So, uh, and that's what we want. Um, so, for a leadership perspective, just the best, uh, whatever that that currently means. You know, just higher blind um, for that. Um, it's an it's an interesting piece the so if i'm trying to describe it let's describe it as you know i like to you know i like to build stuff with you know i spent most of my life doing computer games and websites and you know um tech solutions fintech and over the years it's you know most of the things i've built from a technology perspective you know have disappeared the games nobody plays my games from 19 80s um and uh you know my websites disappeared you know most of my websites you know in the 2000s early 2000s uh and so i quite like got into physical building stuff with the hotel so i, I like to think a lot physically um i like what we're doing today in digital transformation i liken it to um there's a few ways to describe it so it's probably the best way in my mind is is we we're, we're using the same or no, we, we're using different resources, with a, but we're using a new architecture and new tools. So maybe we're using the same resources, but a new architecture and tools when we're doing a building. Or maybe, you know, we're using different resources, um, but we're using the same architecture and then we're going to use new tools. And if you just basically put those three items into different combinations, you've covered the entire digital transformation landscape at, at the moment, yeah? 
and you you need to have a combination that makes sense for you you know and and, and i think the easiest thing to change out of those is for my mind actually the most impactful is the tools um and let me so let me you know maybe make it a bit um uh give you an example so um so imagine you you know suddenly you're going to take your physical shop and you're going to you know go and turn that into a complete e-commerce solution so you've been in shops your whole life e-commerce solution well you know you've got a guy who's called an architect and they do physical buildings well let's not feel a ton of work here uh, you've got philosophy around sh shelf space and a culture of you know physically greeting customers and visually rich well you go digital that's not kind of re relevant anymore and and so you may be selling the same product um but you do have a different way to execute it now the people who have to suddenly this is where where most of them get unstuck or they they, they don't put enough focus on is you know suddenly you've got this kind of basically this, this uh, organizational structure full of humans who did something in a certain way and you are got to pivot them and expect them to build something you know massively new and with all new resources and but with the tools of the old so for example you haven't taught them things like you know agile you haven't taught them things like experimentation rapid prototyping customer journey design thinking you know all these kind of new ways of doing stuff that you know um you know design for data straight through processing um uh might in tech you know microservices um etc cetera, etc cetera. and so their mindsets really in the past an old business and suddenly you rapidly try and create a new without being cognizant of how do i move that biological asset so how's a leader to you? And it's terrifying. I and mean, it really is terrifying for a lot of the staff and especially the older ones. Go to, but my summation is that we're not doing anything new. Really. We might have new resources. We might have, in some cases, new tools. We, you know, but essentially we're doing the same thing we've always done as humans the human body hasn't changed for 250,000 years uh, we're humans yeah and so there was this assumption that that technology could drive and and change human um and some some regard yeah but at the end of the day the future in my mind has always been what the past is it, it's humans interacting with stuff and and so years ago it was you know stones and then obviously bronze and metal and you know machinery and computers and now software and code and AI. I mean, in fairness, there's more li than AI, and um, li is obviously lie. <laughs> and AI, I think the, there's more li than AI uh, by by a multiplier of probably about three to four to one. But anyway, and so. Uh, let's not put technology on such a pedestal that is the universal problem solver. It's actually we're doing the same problems really uh, that we've always done as humanity. I mean, they look different, and you know they have different resources, different things. But essentially, we're just trying to you know organise um, around a a big you know trend which is which is changed everything at the moment. Yeah, which me leads to what you were saying just. Talking about AI, because I think AI is uh, is on the agenda of many, and and we hear that uh, we need to teach AI in business schools. We need to take uh, make uh, yeah make statements about it, uh, take a position about it. We need to to be very aggressive on AI because all the companies, the the students, the prospects, uh, participants, they they want to know more about AI. And I know you have a, a strong view about AI. Uh, you mentioned that uh, a few times. You, you were on stage with some companies claiming that they're doing AI and you, you explained to them that they weren't doing AI. <laughs> that, uh, uh, you know, what we call AI nowadays is not maybe the reality. So uh, wow. what, what is your take about AI? What does it mean? Why, why this buzzword now? Uh, we went from blockchain to or big data uh, to blockchain and now AI. So, so what does it mean for, for you? Um, you know i think it certainly it's having a lot more impact than than blockchain for example you know blockchain very much 
I mean, certainly it's having an impact, don't get me wrong, uh, but it was, it, it was very much a solution looking for a problem in my mind. Whereas AI is essentially, you know, if you want to simplify it into one sentence, AI is data 2.0. Well, that's it. <laughs> it's nothing, it's nothing more complex than that, really. So now we have to explain what data 2.0 is. Well, it's just better than data. So you know, AI is basically just a collection of data that you you know ring into different shapes. And data is the fuel, and you know, you use some code to ring this shape. And there's some, you know, AI got very different variations from what people call AI, just basic if then else. So just like a flow chart, that's the really bottom level going up to machine learning, which is you pump a load of data into a, you know, a black box essentially. And um, it makes correlations across that data. So it matches, you know, photos of cats versus dogs, this kind of the stories you hear. And then up to, you know, cognitive and really getting machines to think more like a human. And then you start to see the, um, uh, you know, what's in that space. So. Um, uh, but it's, it's just data. It, it, like I said, that people think about technology is just lines of Java or C um, or PHP in, in different, you know, uh, variations. Um, AI really just means the same with data. It's just data in different variations and different structures. And and so it just data is starting to manage itself to a certain degree. And so originally you had like, you know, I need an answer. I've got data and then, you know, you analyze and see them to get the answer. That's now AI, basically you tell the AI, the AI find the answer. And, and so really for me, what I mean data 2.0, it's probably not a phrase. It's probably a phrase someone used about 20 years ago. Uh, but in my mind, it's data AI will just merge into one thing. It's just, it'll just be that, yeah, it'll just be, um, it would just be AI. I don't think that we. we would but do you think that the beyond the data itself? I mean, do you think that the algorithms now are, or maybe the computing power of uh, that we have now at at hand is is influencing or impacting what we can do? Because AI, as you mentioned, uh, I mean, most of of us who studied any computer science had to go through AI training kind of uh, long time back. It was very basic. Uh, you, you mentioned that you develop AI also on uh, 2K. I, I forgot now the, 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 the disk, right? Yeah. yeah, 2K memory. Yeah, Basic exactly. machine learning, yeah. So what do you think now is, is fundamentally different that businesses should care about AI compared to before? Because I guess a lot of companies were doing some kind of AI before, uh, even uh, automated case-based reasoning and those things. Uh, could have been considered to be AI, but yeah, what is, yeah. why, why is it now so big? Why are all companies saying we are AI driven? Uh, it's, is it something that is different now or you feel it's the same as before? Just now we just need to use a new buzzword. Uh, you know, consulting companies need to make a living. So uh, <laughs> we, we all need to make a living. So um, now you haven't been to my, here's a shameless plug to my other hotel, Pull Away Paradise in um, an island of um, a pull away of North Sumatra. Um, but um, recently, my hotel um, went to 100% renewable energy. Yeah, and I'm very, very clear, you know, we went to 100% renewable, um, we can make a big marketing message about it, amazing, we're eco, we're green, I mean, you know, blah, 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 we're into reef protection, uh, in situ coral reef protection. And do you know how I was able to do that? Um, the, the government had built a, um, a uh, uh, volcano, um, hydro, uh, not hydroelectric, um, yeah, whatever, uh, electric generation, it'll come to me in a minute, uh, uh, steam off a volcano, electric generation. And because they did that, suddenly my hotel, geothermal, uh, suddenly my hotel had gone green. I didn't do anything. I've still got electric. I didn't change my wiring. I didn't change anything. And so actually every company is now got AI, whether you know it or not. Yeah. It's running a cybersecurity, it's stopping the bad guys, it's looking for patterns for people attacking you. It's filtering your email for you. 
uh, you know, it's helping you manage your PowerPoint. Um, it, it, it's already there in the commodity tools that you use today, is my point. So actually every business, congratulations. Uh, you're all an AI business. Uh, you just never kind of knew it. Um, so if you're a small business, just wait. It's appearing everywhere. It's, it's much more of an impactful trend than, say, blockchain. And the good thing about it, it just appears and stuff just gets easier. So if you get a new version of a, something you've used, a product, a piece of technology, an experience you've used for years and years, and suddenly it got really easier to use, quite possibly, you know, someone's managed to um, get an AI behind that and utilized in the right way to improve that experience for you. Should, should people care about, I mean, when I say care about AI is, uh, blockchain is an infrastructure technology that's, I mean, you don't need to care if you're on a blockchain or not. Should AI be the same thing that, as you mentioned, everyone is the in the business of AI or they're using AI already. So should, should we really care about it in a sense, like give more attention to it or just say, you know what, it's just advances in, in normal computing and we, see, we will see better software, better capabilities overall, but why do we talk so much about it? Um, and why do we keep talking about the fact that we need more AI trained people, uh, why business schools should even put it, this on the agenda of, uh, of their curriculum. Um, is there something there or it's again, another hype that we will see coming and then there will be something else coming afterwards. Uh, because I understand the fundamental changes that we would observe in the, let's say back office of software development. But the question is in the front office for a normal consumer, does it matter uh, for a company? Does it, which is not in tech, does it matter really to talk about AI? Um, if uh, so, I mean, there's certain reasons that businesses would utilize and talk about technology. And so, back to the kind of beginning of the conversation where I got alerted and started to talk about the future of the digital, um, is because technology was being used as this kind of sales you know, angle on me and, 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 you know, I need to, you know, discover why. And it, it really is, you know, as your business, do you need to, um, it's generally used to impress investors. Um, customers, if you say to customers, we use AI, I don't think that their customers really give, give it, you know, give a care about that. I mean, they might want to use a chatbot, but it's not, it's really to a message to partners or investors um, to convince them that you're smart. Yeah, uh, that really. Uh, the use of AI, though, is really, in my mind, is very, very simple. Um, it's just data. And so, do, you know, you, there's nothing you can't, you could do in AI that you couldn't do yourself, believe me. So, basically, get a sh shed load, I said the right word there, shed load of data, yeah? and then get really smart people to write algorithms, which make some sense out of that, that you can commercialize. Yeah, you could do that. You got hundreds and that's historically how, you know, these things have been done. Suddenly AI has been going for decades and decades. Compute's got that cheaper. And essentially how come a lot of these stuff you see in AI, you could have done 50 years ago. The, uh, most of the algorithms really haven't changed. And, What's really changed is the cost of the compute. So suddenly, rather than you know running these algorithms on machines which cost you know a million dollars, um, you know for a certain size, suddenly you can get huge cloud systems dirt cheap. And so the, actually, the biggest progression in AI was that, and then enabled you to do new things. And there's certainly some new stuff around um, um, uh, a lot of the neural stuff and um, and different layers associated with that. But the um, but for the core of it, it's really the text got cheaper. And so um, for me, so you could get a load of data, hire, you know, a load 10 smart people to go across it, mathematicians, write algorithms, and create some assumptions and correlations. And you can find some ways to monetize that. Or you could just get a shed load of, da shed load of data and just run AI across it. So again, it's nothing new <laughs> it's just really it comes down to cost that suddenly the ai is really cheap or free and so small companies get the power they get to pull down 
the big, you know, tools that, that only the big companies could uh, get access to before. Yeah, thanks a lot for sharing on this because I think there's a lot of uh, discussion going on about AI, as I mentioned, and I think uh, uh, sometimes we need to take a step back and, and trying to look at the hype itself to see really if it has a real new impact on things or it's just a normal evolution which is overhyped. So I think you're giving a very interesting perspective on this and, and, and I hope the, the participants will, will understand a little bit better uh, what we mean by AI and, and what the debate is actually about. Um, there's a number of other questions, but before we, we go to the questions about why you're interested in, um, in ecotourism and so on, I, I'd like to ask you one more question about uh, a topic which is now very much on the, let's say, agenda, or uh, I mean, it's on the mind of most of us globally is, is the COVID-19 situation. And so with the COVID-19 situation, we have seen a number of companies um, struggling in terms of their digital transformation. So they, 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 they actually realize also the, the lack of digital capabilities when it comes to enabling their workers to work from home or uh, addressing their customer needs, uh, even accessing their customers for some. So do you think there's a risk now that companies are going, uh, let's say, uh, all, all digital um, and, and, and don't really know what they should be doing? Or do you think that actually this crisis is, is helping companies to target the exact initiatives they need to push forward in order to solve their problems? So because the COVID-19 actually pointed the weaknesses of the business model when it comes to digital, and now the initiatives of digital transformation will be more targeted. Or do you think that's the panic mode and everyone is gonna go in every direction before they kind of uh, understand what they're supposed to do? I think all of those. <laughs> um, and so uh, it dep really depends which industry you're in. And if you look at the different tranches, so um, I fortunately or unfortunately had a have a business in each kind of tranche of COVID impact. So tranche number one is where um, no matter how good your business is and no matter how, how good an operator you are, your business has gone to zero. And so, you know, I firmly believe that I have the best hotels in Indonesia, but I must admit that um, I do have some friends who run some, um, you know, uh, uh, Mandarin Oriental hotels in Indonesia, and maybe they would be the best hotels in Indonesia. So if I'd admit they're the best hotels in Indonesia, yeah. Um, and mine, I could have been the best hotel in Indonesia. Doesn't matter, went to zero. My business went from here in three weeks, to zero, fall to zero for the whole year. Had to mossball the property, put the staff on 50% salary because I knew it was going to be long. And, you know, there's nothing for them to do anyway. Um, and uh, that was it. So I could have been the best in the world. I gone to zero. The, the flights, no tourists is allowed in the country. Uh, no domestic travels allowed. Hotel zero. Um, so tranche one, and that's tough, yeah. And um, now, how do you think about digital transformation in, if that's happened to you? So as a hotel, how do I think about that? Uh, 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 I'm done. Yeah, I'm raising a fundraiser because the village, Bukit Lawang's closed off to tourists. They don't want the orangutans getting affected. Uh, no one's got any money. So everything, every literally 99.9% .9 like Facebook and their revenue from ads, Book it Laoang with the orangutans, their revenue comes from tourism, foreign tourism. It's gone to zero. Yeah. Anyway, fundraiser, you can go to Hotel Orangutans Facebook page, it's up there. So that's tranche one, tough, yeah. Tranche two, and you've got to really think about how we support people in tranche one. Also, you know, restaurants in many countries are in that tranche. Hotel tourism, you know, um, uh, transport, that kind of stuff. Tranche two is where um, businesses are really slowed okay and uh, production's down so some manufacturing um, some retail um, and you know uh, uh, my consultancy business they're slowed right down yeah slowed right down it's very um, difficult in, in a purely uh, you know with the ability not to travel to run uh, all consultancy business has slowed down yeah 
and so that's tranche two. And then tranche three is where things have gone kind of neutral to positive. And this is where you see e-commerce, um, our wealth business in Australia, you know, is neutral. Um, so we had more conversations um, and, you know, having a V-shaped, um, uh, you know, market, which meant we look after, you know, over 2 billion of uh, people's um, money here in Australia. And so we saw a big dip with the in back up, but a lot more conversations, rebalancing. And actually, you know, of our 40,000 clients, we only lost one, um, which I was, I was uh, very proud of. Um, and so, but neutral for us, we didn't make more money. We ended up, you know, because there's a lot more service costs. And, but, you know, it's our business is helping, uh, you know, wealth. That, it, here's the first principle thing for you. So I got interviewed earlier and I said, Neil, if I euro money, what's wealth to you? Is it robo advisory? I said, no, no, no. Wealth is very simple to me. It's helping people with their hopes and fears. That is it. Yeah, that's all wealth is. So I hope when I retire that I can holiday in Sentosa, yeah? Or, you know, I, I fear that the only university I can send my child to would be in, you know, in England. I, mean, I can say that, I'm English. Um, you know, whatever. And so that's really what it's about. It's not buying product. It's not getting insured. It's not the, any of this stuff. It's hopes and fears. I need to protect the things I love. I need to grow the things because they help power my life and most of my milestones in my life are powered by finance. And so I need some, you know, I need some positive achievement in that space. And so it's hopes and fears. And so just going back to first principles is always critical. Yeah. And, um, and, and how do you solve those uh, in, in an effective way? Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, there's a question that uh, Victor asked and I think, uh, it's also one of the position that uh, you're holding now with Razor uh, FinTech, right? Um, it's uh, about the digital banks and, and what, what will make digital banks sustainable or, or sustainably successful in, in, in Singapore, I guess that's the context now. There's a lot uh, going on in the, in the media about these new licenses that MAS is, is uh, launching. And so uh, you had an experience at DBS. So how do you see this arrival of the this neo bank that are, we, we call them in Europe or here digital banks. Do you um, think that there's something that would make them, or what, what are the factors of success for those banks, do you think? Um, you know, there's a whole spectrum of what we think of as digital banks. So all the way from, you know, some huge global bank, which has took its mobile banking and, and kind of given their mobile bank a digital wash to make it a bit more interesting a bit easier to use and re-released it and gone hey ta-da it's digital so that's on one end of the spectrum and on the other end of the spectrum is you know basically payment apps on prepaid cards who do some level of money management and they're saying they're a digital bank um and um and everything you know in between that space so certainly razor beautiful play singapore as a nation is fairly small when you think about consumer um, uh, consumer banking, uh, just population size, it's always, there's a lot of wealth there, but populations, so, so the play is definitely very much for Razor as a global youth bank. So taking that segment, which I feel actually, I don't think anyone's got right yet. Uh, you know, we talk about what, you know, millennials or Gen Z or zillennials want, but we don't really kind of build anything to help them um, achieve what they want to achieve. And thank goodness. Yeah. I imagine when I was growing up, if somebody built a bank to help me achieve what I want to achieve when I was younger, I think, you know, it's doing, um, you know, doing Kung Fu all the time, going to parties and, um, and drinking really cheap Belgian wine. <laughs> so I don't know, maybe a bank account that helps give me discounting and, you know, uh, and that kind of stuff. But, you know, at the end of it, people achieving stuff in their lives. And, you know, we build stuff which is very generic. I mean, all industries do. I mean, think about it. I mean, what one app that has, you know, a billion users. Yes, you, you know, in fairness, the ones at that size are highly kind of self-configuring like the Facebooks and the others. But maybe think about internet banking, mobile banking. 
it's one app which doesn't change and you could have 10 million people using it. Maybe in Singapore, a few million using it, yeah? Yeah, that sounds kind of wrong, yeah? <laughs> I don't know. And we go through this whole process, and the same with any product, yeah? You go through this discovery, you build personas, you know, you understand the problems to be solved, you kind of map out the journeys, and you set the journey team, and then you do rapid prototype and experimentation, and then you kind of loop back and, you know, data-driven insights. You go through this whole thing to build one copy you know one version of an app that's meant to fit you know two million people is ludicrous it, it really is ludicrous but we get better every time and so you know i'm kind of a bit at this current technology phase i'm a little bit bored and i'm waiting for the next one where this stuff just self configures yeah we just talk to it customer designed i said in my app go hey I want the DBS app. You know where I shop, so put in some discounts for me. You know which countries I go to, so give me some FX on that. You know which products I got, and I like the color blue. Build. And, you know, build the oops, email. Build my app. That, that's the future, obviously, because at the moment we got one company building one version of an app which allegedly can serve you know, millions of people. And the future is that the customer buyer, that's the beauty of things like AI, is you could build that today. What I just described, you could build today. I could build it. Um, I, probably, I could even write the software, admittedly, my age. <laughs> I don't write much software, and it's generally very buggy. But I could pull together a team, and I could build that now. It's all there. But, of course, how do you get that to scale across millions of clients and all the different variations and the you know, the voices and the language understanding and blah, 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 and it's regulated. And it's all very complex, but the technology is there to do that. And so we're in this phase at the moment where we're stretching, really stretching the world of the old, i.e. build one version of an app that's meant to serve millions of people. And we're going to be crossing over the chasm into the world of the new, which is user-defined experiences. Mm -hmm. So it, it kind of answers the, the question that we got about digital rewards space and digital vouchers over paper voucher. I think uh, you kind of touched uh, on this question uh, when, uh, when you had explained that actually uh, somehow an app can do it. The question is how do you scale it? Uh, because nowadays it's true that, and you mentioned this a few times during this conversation that Technology got simpler. Uh, when you wanted to build a, a web page uh, before, you had to know HTML, and and then you need to do you had to know CSS, and then you had to know PHP, and and then uh, JavaScript, and so on and so forth. Right. So we, we had to learn all these technologies to be able to build something. But nowadays, it's just clicking a button. Even creating an app nowadays is very simple. So the the the, the question is afterwards uh, putting. Uh, into action, a technology is not so difficult. It's how you build a business model around it, which and and, and scale it seem to be more difficult. The execution. Uh, I heard many people coming to me also over the years in the fintech festivals, for example. They would say, say "Hey, you know, I'm I'm interested in launching mobile a mobile payment app," and and, and then you just start asking. And I think it reply it it also answers the question about digital banks. How many wallets do people carry on them? How many do they want? Do you want to carry yourself? Um, if if you already have one or two credit cards, you have already a PayPal account. Maybe your bank is proposing digital wallets. Maybe you're using Grab. So how many other applications have we used? So the question is, uh, in a limited market like Singapore, um, what can you expect in terms of of growth? And and that's that's a bit of a question I have. Uh, I had a, actually you 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 answered it about the digital banks because. Mm. The, the I don't think it's a license. domestic play. It's not yeah. for con, you'd be. I mean, you, I think you'd be a fool to launch a digital bank that was consumer and domestic in Singapore. Um, not that Singapore's my second home, yeah, and it's full of lovely people, and you know, uh, thankfully many of them have some money. But it's a population thing, yeah, and consumer business is a scale game, and you need a certain because you're not going to be able to address 100 percent of the market. So if you address maybe as a, you know, get to 5% of the market. In Singapore, that's a very small number. And yet in, in other markets, um, like some in Europe or the US or in Indonesia, 
um, Japan, etc. That's quite a big number. And, and so some of the business models which rely on scale mm. to achieve profitability just don't work in Singapore. But what works really well in Singapore is, is running global initiatives and also going through the corporate structure. And so because so many companies are headquartered in Singapore, the B2B to C models or B to B to C to B to B to B to A, I don't know what that means in Japan, but they get quite complex. Uh, that works really well. And so you can distribute down and into the different countries. But, you know, as a hub and, and scale, well, yeah, I mean, perfectly positioned, yeah. On one side, you've got Indonesia, depending, you know, um, uh, you know, on any given day, 260 million people there. Now, you've got the Philippines just up the road again, big, you know, 100 million plus. Um, same, you've got Vietnam, you've got Thailand up there with big populations, even you know, Asia, yeah. There's all, you know, eight times, you know, Singapore site. And so um, if you're doing something and, it, but certainly in Singapore, there's, you know, for business banking, wholesale banking, there's probably enough trade, you know, there's enough problems to be solved still across things like trade finance, FX, and, you know, it's trouble with small businesses. We, whereas consumers, there's been a lot of focus in taking the kind of top end and bringing it to the bottom. So bringing, you know, the best from private banking and advisory and giving that down to general consumers. Whereas in, in corporate banking, so kind of business banking, you've seen less of that. You see less of reaching up into high end institutional banking and bringing those systems and processes and people down to distribute the SME level. It just hasn't happened. And, and, um, and so technology can play a huge place. If you look at, some of the really successful startup banks, Judo here in Australia, um, and I'm a customer of them, love them to bits. But very much their thing was about how do we optimize the humans and, and you know, enable them to understand the businesses and make effective credit decisions. You've got Oak North out of the UK, SME Bank, um, again, doing incredibly well in this space. Um, and, um, and, and so, I think for the Singapore digital licenses, it's going to be good. It's going to, it can only be good, yeah. It's going to drive some, get a bit of fear in the market. You know, the only way banks tend to change is if there's a bit of fear or, you know, a bit of money, let's face it. And most companies are the same. <laughs> let's be truthful on it. And um, so that's good. And so all the, all the banks could get, you know, a, a bit better to use from a client perspective, maybe a bit of the cost is taken out. But the digital banks very much is a regional play. It has to be, unless you can target a high value niche, and that would have to be private bank or something around kind of um, SME on mass or a trade um, objective. But yeah, it's just, but yeah. So, Razor, use banking. We've got a great brand globally, uh, we've got very loyal um, and um, engaged followers. There's, you know, nobody's really solved for that in my mind. You know, the, the, the youth say, you know, what are achieves and stuff? Yeah, they're vastly different from the youth previously. And how do we build something that kind of makes sense to them? And that's what we're working on. Yeah, thanks to, 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 to talk about the, the, let's say the B2B kind of business, because I think a lot of the startups we know are in the B2C space. So it's very attractive uh, in, in some way. And a lot of startups, I see a lot of students also uh, at ESSEC going into entrepreneurship, uh, they, they try to address the C because they understand the C. When it comes to B2B, it seems that to be an entrepreneur in, in that space, you need to know the industry quite well because you need to understand what are the processes you just mentioned that are not optimized or maybe where the gaps that you can, uh, you can actually exploit. While when you, you're, you're graduating from, uh, or you even drop out of college, uh, it's a bit more difficult if you don't have a knowledge of this industry. And I remember um, Niklas Jenström, uh, uh, the founder of Skype and Casa. So what he was saying, is that he was saying that uh, actually he was able to disrupt, let's say the music industry and also the telecom with Skype. And, and in some way, he, he, he said, you need to have some knowledge of the industry. He was, a, he was a, actually an employee in a telecom operator before. 
because you need to understand where are the pain points, what are the uh, capabilities of, of telcos, and when you see that they cannot address the market properly, there's an opportunity there. So I could see um, how successful entrepreneurs uh, were able to leverage their expertise in their industry, like from their industry, and then do something. And maybe that's what you have been doing successfully in, uh, with your new venture, uh, Picture Wealth, right? Because if you were not coming from the banking industry, you, maybe you wouldn't have seen the opportunity also, right? So there's a lot of, uh, uh, I, I mean, execution, uh, knowledge that you need to have in order, especially in the finance yeah. industry, it seems so. But certainly, um, yes and no, I think, to that. Um, so one from a, um, a perspective of someone who's kind of jumped industries before, um, and there's a certain, you know, there is, over time, you build up a toolkit where I could confidently say that I could pretty much enter any industry and quite quickly uncover what the major issues um, and when you get to that, I, mean, I always see myself in fairness as a general innovator. I've spent time in finance because that's where there's some big problems and, you know, they pay incredibly well. Let's be truthful. Um, and it affects, you know, everyone. So, you know, the scale of the stuff is interesting. Uh, but it, it's the same problems. As an in, I consider myself an innovator, not a fintech person. And, and so, you know, I've built hotels. I did the architecture. I had to design the menus, I had to do the operations, I had to do the digital marketing, you know, I've designed aquariums in my life, I've taught Kung Fu, I've been a bodyguard, um, I've been, worked in sales, I've worked in front-end software development, middleware development, gateway development, database development, IT operations, um, and, you know, now I'm co-founder and, and and so it, it depends. It depends. So if you, innovation for me is the ability to look at things from all different aspects and all different angles and bring diverse people together to solve what we feel is an important issue, yeah, that can have an outcome. So innovation is really for me is find the right problem and not the wrong problem, not the symptom of the problem, but find the right problem is to solve it in an elegant manner. And it, it doesn't mean, elegance doesn't mean it has to be beautiful, but it really can't be ugly. Elegance to me is just, you know, spend the exact amount of money, solve it with just the amount, right, right amount of resources, don't overspend, don't overspec, and, and do it in a smart way that you're proud of. Yeah, the way you solve that problem was, they had some pride. You look at the solution, you smile. That's what I like to do is look at, the way I've solved some problems through my career. And I still smile when I think about how I did that. I thought that's really elegant, you know, and, um, and that's important. We're losing a lot of that in the world today. Um, you know, we're using a lot of steam hammers to solve, really using AI to solve really simple, you know, problems that you could do with one or two lines of code. Um, but, but anyway, so, and, and so if you think like that, then, industry knowledge is less relevant. And, and if you're good at pulling people together, um, I mean, with Picture Wealth, yeah, I've worked, in bank, I've worked in a bank once. You know, I worked in Microsoft, selling to bank. Was I a wealth expert? God, no. You know, um, I said, well, I, I am and I'm not. I'm a weird beast that I, I see wealth as solving people's hopes and fears. That's a little bit weird, but probably absolutely spot on. Uh, does that make me a wealth expert in all the operational processes, regulation? Well, God, no. Heavens, no. But my mate and someone I've been working with, you know, over the course of 10 years, David Pettit, my co-founder, I, I know exactly that he is. And, and so as an innovator, you find the people who are and who do understand, and you can you pull together this diversity and go after and solve something that could be monetized or or that's impactful if you're on, on that side of the equation. And, um, uh, and so there's that. But as maybe a more, I wouldn't say junior, but earlier in your innovation career, certainly going through your own history. So that's why we see, as you rightly pointed out, a lot of consumer facing innovation, because you know you touch stuff, you're a customer, you understand to a certain degree. And then if you've worked in a particular industry, then you have the background on that. But as you mature and become 
more of an innovation leader. I mean, I work most, I work outside of finance. A lot of the work that I've been doing recently has been working in automotive sales, for example. Um, you know, I've been working in really deeply into financial advisory. I've never, ever done that before. And it's sort of picture well spent. So, you know, we, um, essentially the, the core, you know, business model is financial advisory, just done it massive scale, better, you know, cheaper, more transparent and um, customer at the center kind of stuff. And so you, you can, I think uh, generally earlier in your career, you're innovating about stuff you know, and then kind of later in your career, you get older, grumpy, you know, maybe grow a beard, get a bit fat like myself. Uh, but you can kind of enter pretty much different arenas and you can still be quite successful. Yeah, thanks a lot for sharing. I think it's, it's very inspiring <laughs> for many. Uh, I, I think we're reaching uh, slowly uh, the end of this fire chat. Um, I think just a, a quick uh, a quick thought uh, for finishing. It seems that to me, you, you've been constantly talking today about problem solving and, and how important it is to understand the problem before uh, jumping on any technology. And I think the reason uh, why, uh, you know, in some way you explain this future isn't digital. I think it's really about, you know, understanding the problem. Is, is it a digital problem or not? Uh, we didn't touch uh, on the topic of, of uh, this digital island that, that uh, you, I, I invite the, the different participants who are interested to further discussion to go and see your, your, your post on LinkedIn about the digital island. Because I think it's, it's interesting to see that actually one of the things that you're pushing is to, to say that, hey, every company today has um, some asset. They can leverage on physical assets uh, and, and they should not forget that. They should not uh, try to emulate uh, the, 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 the digital player, let's say the pure players, and, and, and hope to be as good as they are in their space. But they should actually create things uh, in the physical world that these companies cannot do. And, and I think uh, if, if we take this, uh, this stance again about uh, problem solving, understanding the pain points of your customers or the, the frictions that you encounter in the ecosystem, you'll be probably a much better entrepreneur and innovator than if you focus mainly on implementing blindly technologies to every problem you see. Uh, like you mentioned about the blockchain, which seem to be a solution looking for a problem more than anything. Um, so. Yeah, I, I really enjoyed this conversation because I think it puts a lot of, um, of things in perspective when it comes to digital transformation and, and, and why uh, people should yeah, uh, be more skeptical in some way about how uh, they, they tackle digital uh, transformation overall. So, um, yeah, thanks a lot, uh, Neil. I don't know if Victor wants to say something before we finish. Um, I see that he's there on the screen. Uh, all I want to do is thank you both for your time and for the fireside chat. Um, it was um, intriguing. And I think uh, those themes that you've just summarized, Jan, came through loud and clear. So, Neil, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts with us. Jan, thank you for doing a grand job on, on moderating. And a big thank you to our audience. Thank you so much for being with us this afternoon. Um, let us know how we can help you further at here to help at sicc.com.sg. Like anybody else, we don't have all the answers to all your questions, but uh, we want to do as much as we can to help you, uh, particularly through what's going to be a pretty rough time. So thank you, take care, and we look forward to seeing you again very soon. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.